In this video, we will take a look at what's the best way to deal with all the different formulas that appear in the FRM Part 1 curriculum. By all means, there are lots of formulas in the curriculum and you will be faced with this question as to whether from an exam standpoint all of these formulas need to be memorized or not. Well, the best way to deal with all these formulas so that it becomes as painless as possible is to at least mentally categorize all these formulas into different camps because for each of these different camps there is a different strategy. Let's begin with the first of these camps and this one includes all those formulas which are heavily tested in the exam. Okay, so for each of these formulas, if you were to be given the luxury of time, you could have very well derived these formulas. But in an exam setting, there is no way out but to quickly recall these formulas and to apply them correctly. Examples of formulas that would go into this category are, for example, the probability mass function of the Poisson distribution. This is the formula and let's say the second formula which would go into this camp is the formula for calculating the modified duration given the Macaulay duration. Okay. Now, how do you remember these formulas? Please make sure that these more testable formulas have been applied time and again to different types of questions. It is the application of these formulas that will help you remember these formulas accurately. Remember and apply these formulas. Okay. Also, for each of these formulas, alongside the actual formula, also try and remember a little narrative that goes along with the formula. That narrative will help you accurately recall the formula. Also. If you have recalled the formula, let's say after a long gap of time, okay, and it took you some effort to recall the formula, when you've written it down, try and do a quick sanity check. For example, for this formula, if I were to take lambda, the mean or the average rate of arrival of events, down to a zero, then the probability of me observing a certain number of events should also go down to zero. So in this formula, try and substitute lambda equal to zero and quickly check that the probability also comes out to be zero for any given x. If you had written down this formula incorrectly, for example, lambda to the power x was written in the denominator, this sanity check would very quickly help confirm if you have recalled the formula correctly or not. At least a sanity check will help detect the most common types of errors that you will be committing. Okay? Then another check that you can do on any given formula is to do some kind of a simple dimension analysis. For example, in this formula, in the denominator, you have 1 plus y times tau. If you had just written 1 plus y, then something is wrong. 1 is dimensionless, but y, an interest rate or let's say a yield, has this dimension of per unit time. Therefore, y has to be scaled by a time input before it can be added to this dimensionless quantity, which is 1. Okay, So, a dimensions analysis also helps in many cases uncover anything wrong in a given formula. Then let's move to category number two and this would include those formulas which don't have to be memorized from scratch. Thankfully in this category we are talking about those formulas which share a common template with other formulas that we already know. For example, if I were to ask you to write down the PDF, the density of x, a normally distributed random variable with mean mu and variance sigma squared, well, this is the formula. But instead of remembering this formula, I would rather remember 
some kind of a template or some kind of a source formula and alongside the adjustments that need to be made to start from the source formula and finally arrive at my target formula. So for example, for this case, I would rather remember the density of a standard normal variable z and this is what the density would look like. Okay? So if I remember this formula and again you can devise your own set of sanity checks for this formula also, then if this is my source formula, I can make these adjustments to arrive at my target formula. So for example, if x is normally distributed, I can write x in terms of z as x is equal to mu plus sigma times z, which tells me that z is x minus mu over sigma and I can very quickly start with this formula, replace the z by x minus mu over sigma. Also, please note that the PDF is used to arrive at the probability of a continuous random variable lying in the vicinity of a chosen value. Okay, So, for example, lying in a thin strip in the vicinity of a chosen value. So, if I were to create a thin strip around z, let its width be dz, then this formula tells me that dz is equal to dx divided by sigma. So, the width of the strips is related by this factor of sigma. Therefore, when I write down this PDF, I need to have this sigma sitting here. Okay? So, the adjustments required are replace z by this guy, divide by sigma to take care of the difference in the widths. Okay? Then, let's take a look at another example. If I were to assume that my losses are normally distributed, mean mu variance sigma squared, I can verbally interpret and write down the formula for the var calculated at a confidence level C to be very simply start with the mean and that's mu of this normal distribution, move to the right these many multiples of the standard deviation sigma. The number of multiples depends on the level of confidence. Okay? Now, if I were to ask you, well, I have accepted and digested this VAR formula, what about the formula for the expected shortfall? Again, what I can do is that I can treat this to be my source formula and remember the adjustments which need to be made to arrive at my target formula. In this case, the expected shortfall at confidence level C again can be written to follow the same template and that is start at the mean of the distribution, move to the right this time by these many multiples of the standard deviation sigma. How many multiples? It is actually the PDF of the standard normal distribution evaluated at ZC that divided by the level of significance which is 1 minus c. See, it's the same template. Then, if I were to take a look at these two formulas, this is the formula for the value of a forward contract. This is the formula, the Black-Scholes formula for finding out the, the premium of a European call. Again, you can see both these formulas, they are so similar to each other. Whenever you encounter such formulas which look very similar, try and understand why there is a similarity between these two formulas. Is this similarity because of some underlying reason, some underlying connection? Is one of the two formulas which are so similar to each other a special case of the other formula? If I were to stretch let's say the inputs of one of these formulas, do I arrive at the other formula? If you were to do this quick analysis, it will help you get a much better conceptual clarity around these formulas. Okay? This is camp 2. Now let's come to camp 3. Now this would include those formulas for which the formula is not that important as compared to the process that you use to apply that formula. 
For example, if let's say I were to write down the formula for let's say you know finding out a conditional expectation. I am restricting myself to a discrete random variable. Okay, so in this case, actually, I have two random variables x1 and x2. Both of them are discrete. This is what the formula would look like. This formula, it appears much neater because I have written down the probability that goes into this summation as a separate formula. Imagine if I would have written down this formula as a single formula, it would have appeared much more complex. But if I was creating a formula sheet, should I really enter this formula in my formula sheet? Actually, I am better off if I were to insert in my formula sheet the steps or the process that it takes to arrive at my conditional expectation. Again, if I were to restrict myself to discrete random variables, in any given question, what I'll be given is a probability matrix containing joint probabilities. Okay, so if I am conditioning on this random variable, which is x2, it is allowed to take values in this set S. In this probability matrix, it's the x2 which varies along the columns and it's x1 which varies along the rows. The first step, therefore, is to mark here the set S, the values which x2 is allowed to take. So let's say it's this red region which I have marked. Beneath this red region, mark the joint probabilities that you will be using. Then sum up this entire orange region, what do you get? You get the probability of x2 taking a value in this set S. That's my denominator in this formula. Then for each of these rows, sum up the entries in the orange shaded region and fill out this column. Okay. Conditional expectation is very simply the sum product of this column and this column divided by the total of this shaded region. Okay, and that's what this formula is trying to achieve. See, if I were to remember the process, it's much simpler as compared to remembering this formula. Okay, so this is my camp three, those formulas for which, forget about the formula, remember the process. Then finally, in camp four, you must have guessed it by now, I would include those formulas which from an exam standpoint needn't be memorized. If let's say I were to start any given topic by taking a look at how the learning objective for that topic is phrased, that will give me a guidance as to whether the formulas appearing in that topic need to be memorized or not. Okay. So, for example, a formula which needn't be memorized is the, D, the PDF, the density of log normal distribution. This is how the density looks like. Again, if you have memorized this formula, again, you can remember a few adjustments that will help you arrive at this formula. But still, if I were to place myself in an exam setter's shoes and trust the fact that my exam questions will follow the learning objectives and how they are phrased, I needn't remember this formula. For log normal distribution, I am better off remembering the CDF formula for the log normal distribution, how the probabilities of a log normally distributed random variable can be calculated using the probability of an analogous normally distributed random variable. I am better off remembering the formula of let's say the mean and maybe even the variance of a log normally distributed random variable. Okay, So this video was about understanding what's the best way to deal with all the different formulas which appear in the part 1 curriculum, a few tips that will help you recall the formula accurately and also apply it as correctly as possible.